success in life There's greatness inside of you Let's do greatness with love Unleash it in the greatness of The greatness of His love Transformation that you can have Coming from God above Welcome to the greatness hub Welcome to the greatness hub out of the box every Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. only on the Greatness Hub online channel. At the Greatness Hub, together we discover, we develop, and we dominate our greatness. See ya! In last week's episode, we were able to travel halfway across the globe and had a conversation with Miss Gay, who is a high school teacher in the USA. We were all inspired with the discovery approach she uses and the cooperative learning she applies in her high school mathematics class, both pre-pandemic and now even during remote learning. She believes that students can do well in math with the help of their peers and the guidance of a teacher as the facilitator inside the classroom as well as at home. To widen our horizons, we are very lucky to be graced by a high school teacher all the way from the United States. Let us all welcome Miss Christine Kenya Savage or Miss Kay. Hi, Christine. Hi. Uh, I honestly try to tie math in as much as I can to games. Uh, a lot of my students like video games, so if I can even design the lesson to be like level one, level two, level three, so it actually feels like indirectly they're playing some sort of video game, they tend to be really involved in the class. What tips can you give to high school students doing the remote learning at home and to parents who are maybe facilitating or helping these students um, do the distance learning at home? The biggest one is contact the teacher. If something is happening at home, if some like an incident happened or you're not understanding it, as in the student doesn't understand it, or even as a parent, you're a bit confused with what's going on, immediately contact the teacher because we do have a lot of resources to help you out. Uh, my second tip is basically like tutoring, go to tutoring. Um, definitely use Google. Google's gonna be your best friend, trying to understand the material. There's so many videos online. The third tip is remember why you're doing all of this. This is to ensure that you do have a better future. With everything that you've shared with us tonight, Christine, um, what really can you consider as your educational innovation? So discovery base, if you were to go into the classroom, it's gonna look like I'm not doing anything. The thing with discovery base is you're doing a lot of work in the background, as in you're actually predicting what situations your students might run into. You're also preparing yourself to just roll with it. So when you go into my classroom and you see how the classroom is running smoothly, like you'll actually see students start to do now, they'll even start the timer. Uh, they'll go into certain problems and start a timer for that as well. And they're basically running the class the entire time. Whereas it looks like I'm just walking around checking in to see if everything's flowing well. I've already predicted it and I basically created the material so it actually guided them through the lesson. So Discovery has the misconception of being lazy teaching, but you're doing a lot of work in the background. So it, I can honestly say if you were going to wing discovery lesson or teaching, the students are immediately going to catch on to it and start calling you out. <laughs> in life, there's greatness inside of you. Let's do greatness with love. 
unleash it in the greatness of the greatness of His love. Transformation that you can have coming from God above. Welcome to the greatness of. Welcome to the greatness of. Great evening, everyone. I'm Coach Carrie, and welcome to Teaching Out of the Box, where inspirational conversations on educational innovations and redesign learning experiences are delivered by guests who are on the educational field day in and day out. Thank you so much for those who watch our previous two episodes on primary and high school education. This week, we are going to venture into college. Our guest for today is a Bachelor of Science in Physical Therapy graduate, last 2015. She is also a U.S. licensed therapist in New York, currently a faculty member of a premier university in Cebu, and is a member of the Philippine Physical Therapy Association Cebu chapter, and is currently taking her master's degree in physical therapy. Help me welcome my student before, now a college educator, Ms. Silver Lynn Marie Sabandal, PTRPPT. Good, great evening, Silver Lynn. Good evening. Um, for everybody's information, for, for the audience to know, she was my student for a few months in high school when I was doing my practicum. I could remember the trend back then was Korean dances, K-pop <laughs> dances. Silverlin was the, like the leader of their group in doing those dances. The song of Girls' Generation, every time it plays, it always uh, brings me back to the time when I was yet a college student doing my practicum in the school and uh, where Silverlid and my sister were um, having their high school. No? So do you still remember those times, Silverlin? Yes, it makes me feel like a K-pop tita already because uh, so K many new generations are coming out right now. <laughs> and it really surprised me and amazed me that um, Silverlin is now a college instructor. Um, I am somehow attached to them because, yeah, I've seen them in high school and I see them like every now and then. And then my sister gives me feedback. It amazes me that Silverlin is now a college teacher. Um, can you tell us a bit of a background on how you became a teacher knowing that you graduated BS Physical Therapist? Can you uh, bring us back to that journey? Okay. Um, thank you for that question, Miss Carrie or Ate Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I never really intended to become like a professor or a university instructor in the long run for like five years now, almost six years, because um, practically I have plans to work abroad and really practice my profession full on as a physical therapist. However, um, the first encounter that I have or experience with in being an instructor is when I became a clinical instructor right after my uh, Philippine licensure exam. So I chose a profession wherein I can still have a time to practice my profession at the same time, uh, review for my um, USPT board exam. So, and then I was also taking some units as part-time faculty member to add up to my income. However, right after I got my USPT license, uh, we have so many things to prepare, the paperwork. So I decided to transfer as a full-time faculty member to always like refresh my knowledge as well so that I can apply it in the future. And um, within the span of time, I actually learned to love the job and see the growth of the students from being a student to uh, becoming a professional PT. So that's it. Yeah. Were there struggles that you have met along the way? <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, provided that uh, we have like one to two years age gap with some of my students. So it's hard to be uh, to treat them professionally because some of them are my friends before. And then also with the content and the protocols of our course outline and syllabus i'm actually quite knowledgeable about it because we have courses before in our undergraduate program such as teaching and learning so we were also trained not only to become clinical practitioners but also as educator physical therapists so we have lots of courses 
on which part of our profession we can enter when we become professional someday. Oh, uh, that's great. At least uh, you had subjects before on how to teach. I am watching the videos that you have sent me about your students, and I'm so amazed that physical therapist is just beyond doing what you're ought to do. It's really communicating to your patients, to the, the people that you're serving. And I am really excited to dig deeper into our discussion today. So what is your best memory of your face-to-face -face interaction with your students? My best memory when um, we had our face-to-face -face interaction is actually every during our lab practical examination or return demonstration because since physical therapists are also called movement specialists, so it's best that we assess them like in a manual or face-to-face -face setting and how they handle the patient, position the patient, stabilization, and overall patient safety. And like in the virtual setting, it's really different. And also when I had subjects before that we have clinical rotation, so I can see their excitement. The, the very first time that they encounter a real patient, assess them thoroughly, and then they get to wear their scrubs or become in, when they become interns. It's, it's like a badge uh, for the years that they have um, learning theories. So the theories that I've learned in the classroom set, they can really apply it to um, the clinical setting. So I think that's it. As well as every time a student or a batch graduates and we get to see their names listed in the PRC list for those of us, so that moment is always special to me. Yes, of course, seeing your students also like achieve something or achieve yeah. their dreams after you have been with them for, let's say, a few years. We will be sharing to the audience, um, Silver Lynn, some pictures of you as a teacher, both pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. We would like you to like share a bit of information to us, the story behind each of the pictures. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so we will start. Okay, these two pictures. So this is our faculty. We have our dean there, our chairman, and most of my faculty members. So we were just celebrating my birthday that day. So that's our um, faculty room. And uh, can you say that one of the reasons why you stayed long um, as a teacher for five years now is the support of the faculty or the colleagues that you work with. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, one of the most important, um, for every professional, one of the most important reasons of staying for quite a long time is that you have a good relationship with your um, colleagues. What is one? Um, this is one of the Christmas parties that we have. So we are just like being happy that the event is done and everyone enjoyed the event. Yeah, events like this are one way of distressing from stressful workload. All right, how about this one? Another picture of us in a Christmas party, like um, getting together, exchanging gifts, and as you have said, distressing from all the workloads of the whole year. So this is like a year-end party slash Christmas party as well. Okay, how about this one? A different side of yeah of <laughs> okay so we have this annual like um annual event in our department and so as fa faculty members we also get to play with the students have our own team and challenge the students of course um, due to our age <laughs> and <laughs> no practice time so of course the students will actually when so we're just there for fun and support and um just make the event merrier that's it right. so how about this one this time these i think these are your students yeah these students are um special to my heart because they are my first advisory class so i get to see their growth from first year to until now they are actually interns already so so every birthday, is give, they give something special for me and uh, just cakes and balloons to appreciate my <laughs> effort in uh, rearing them <laughs> to become okay. what they are now. Okay, so you mentioned advisory class. What is the role of an advisor in a college setup? Well, actually, the advisor for each batch will 
collate all of their class records and then um, update them with their um, class standing. Um, like also in a way an amateur guidance guidance counselor for their pro um, personal problems, get to talk to them why they are um, getting behind from the class. So that's um, that's why they're very special because I know their personal stories, most of them, if not all. <laughs> It's it's really surprising for me actually, Silverlin, that that's basically the same um task of an advisor in high school and in elementary, right? And it's surprising that even if they are already in college, they they still have their advisor to personally give them advices, not just in academics but also in personal life. In what way do you think being advisor has changed your perspective in being a PT and being a teacher as well? With this experience, I can see them myself with in their shoes. Okay, so I get to also um, realize that we had the same experiences when I was still a student. So I get to give them the correct advices on what to do. And I think that would be all generally, like to guide them correctly on the process and also on how to handle stress and how to de-stress as well. So I get to also um, be with them or party with them. <laughs> If that's the correct term, um, during like after exams, since again we have like a short age gap, so we uh, uh, we have this same intellectual level and also fun level. So I guess that's the most enjoyable part of being a college instructor. Uh, okay, how about this one? Tell us a picture. Uh, tell us the story behind uh, these students in blue this time. Okay, so this time, actually annually, we have this uh, class picture because I am an ad advisor, as I've said before, so class picture of um, from second year, third year, fourth year. And then finally, um, I think they are the last watch that um, have the five-year program for physical therapy because the next batches are undergoing the K-12 program already. So the physical therapy program is now four years. So oh, this is yeah. the last. This is the last batch that is um, who did the five-year program, and we are actually my advisory class who are now interns. That's so great. I, this is I, I just a happy day. Yeah, yeah, I am happy also that um, what we are doing in the basic education curriculum, me being a senior high school teacher for five years now, um, we are actually um, contributing something to the college education as well. So in that manner, um, we are, how to say, we are shortening the, the, the college program. So although we are lengthening here, the high school department, we are adding two years, but in the college, we are um, subtracting one year. In that way, I don't know if you could already feel the, the effect, if, yes. if in the college level, we could feel the effect that a lot of students are already more determined on what degree they would like to take. One of the main um, reasons for senior high is to eliminate shifting from one course to another. I hope um, gradually there will be that effect and in that manner the student can really pursue what course they will be taking. Yes, personally, I appreciate the works of the, um, your work as a secondary um, level yes, secondary. educator. So we can actually feel that the students for now, first years have um, more know-how and knowledgeable of the course because they have taken up some basic human anatomy, gross anatomy, so they already have knowledge on um, the basic bones and muscles and structures. So it's easier for them to grasp the, the, the more difficult topics of the different courses for physical therapy. So thank yes, you for and, that. <laughs> thank you also. <laughs> Unlike us who went into college straight without knowing what we really want, the first year and the second year for sure was a struggle, diba? Right? In yes. one way or another, it crossed our minds. Um, are we really fit for the course that we are taking? Uh, some of the people we know have shifted from one course to another. And we just hope that this um, K-12 curriculum has really helped our um, future graduates and future students. Okay, so uh, tell us this one. I think these are still about the interns. Yeah, so 
again, when the um, list of interns will be revealed, so they get to be very excited. And uh, before we actually start the internship program, we tend to have this team building um, activity so that they will get to know each other well and um, establish a bond, especially they, they will be grouped into certain centers or hospitals. So it's nice that uh, they get to know the character and how to handle um, their colleagues someday. So, and also for the educators as well. So it's like a regrouping and um, just building bonds together. Am I right, Silverlin, that when they go to intern in different hospitals, you also like check on them once in a while? Yes, we. Um, they have. They still have um, courses or subjects right after their day of internship. Say, for example, from um, eight to five. If they if they are assigned in Cebu City, of course, because some of the interns will be assigned in Manila, Iloilo, because we have some hospitals there of affiliations. So if they are um, just assigned here in Cebu City, so they get to work for like eight to five or eight to four, and then go back to our school and have some review classes, revalidas, um, semester um, courses wherein we get to um, talk about the different cases and apply what is the correct assessment and treatment. So it's a continuing education for both the interns and the uh, um, educators as well. Because when they become interns, they are not already um, the advisor's um, responsibility because we have our own clinical coordinators to do that. However, the clinical coordinators were also really the um, performance of the interns who were our previous students. So with that, we can remind them, reprimand them if they had like uh, mistakes, uh, or um, they need some improvement when um, handling patients or um, talking to their superiors. So we still get to advise them and they still ask me for some advices as well on how to study with their revalidas and what interventions to give to this type of patient. So those are some of the examples. Okay, that's great. Okay, so you've given me some of your students' output. Let's just have a run through. Actually, these are videos that I've um, I did some screenshots and just give us a little background on these um, output. Um, this is the pre-pandemic. So this video is all about um, proper body mechanics. So one of the courses of the second years, I think, is um, the function of physical therapy. So of course, um, we give them cases and then they get to um, apply that in a video or an infographics uh, as a basis of awareness as well for um, the general population, not only for themselves, their relatives, but if they post it in social media, then they can also give awareness to um, normal individuals and give awareness to our profession as a physical therapist because um, I think the general population, especially here in the Philippines, have this negative connotation or um, perception of what a physical therapy uh, professional is and they only think that we only do massage and such but actually we are movement experts so uh, we are more complex than that. All right, so this these are also other um, outputs that you've sent me. Yes, these are neurological assessment for patients who uh, experience stroke or uh, traumatic brain injury or spinal cord injury. So this is how you do the assessment for their sensation and their uh, sense of uh, movement awareness, which is your kinesthesia. So these are just samples of the assessments that we do before we give interventions. Okay, this one too? This one too is about assessment, but range of motion, because every parts of our body or joints have normal range of motion. So if it's lesser than that, then you have probably contractures or weak muscles that limits those movements. Or if, um, if it's greater than the normal range of motion, then uh, you may be hyperreflexive or your um, ligaments are lax and such. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I think this is the last video you sent me. 
Yes, this is one of the uh, projects that we have pro post pandemic. Okay, so um, one of the integral part of physical therapy is uh, also becoming a wound uh, specialist. Okay, so since most of the patients who had traumatic brain injury or stroke or SEI cannot move anymore, right? Or they are bedridden, so they are prone to wound, especially pressure sores on their back. So um, before we give interventions, we actually assess their um, wound. So this is your wound assessment, and I actually just told them to carve their own wound on a styrofoam and uh, prepare the materials needed for the actual wound assessment in a clinical setting. So we have to do some um, things to just let them imagine, because unlike before that, we get to see um, real patient, but this time, um, this is just a wound assessment for those patients who have pressure sores. I am amazed by this innovation, even though I know that this is only a styro ball with a, with a wound. But when I watched the video, I cringed, actually. So that's the reason why I can't be in the medical field at any point. No, but I'm very much amazed that um, during the pandemic, we, have, we are very limited with what we can let our students do. In, in high school, um, we were already worrying on how to deliver. But of course, we know in college, it's a more... Um, worrisome. It was a more work worrisome time for teachers and students because how are they going to do laboratory? I mean, lab classes, lab sessions, and the like. And looking at this um, video, the um, output from your student, I am really amazed because um, the student was still able to like deliver to you, and you were still able to assess how much the student really know about this one, about the the topic and the concept. And it's amazing that. He was able to come up with this and of course um you still have a lot of outputs like this so yes. i think these, this these are your um innovations and your redesigned learning experiences in the times of a pandemic and of course um, we are very familiar with um online classes and uh, how can you compare pre-pandemic face-to-face -face classes and now pandemic or during the pandemic or post-pandemic um, classes, class delivery when it comes to um, physical therapy? Mm, it's really quite different. Uh, say, for example, when you do your discussions, you don't get to see their real reactions. Some of them will just turn off their camera. So, and also um, the feedbacks is just through chat or just simple yes, miss or no, miss. And like before that, we can actually interact. I, I can see their um, facial reactions if they're not interested anymore. So I tend to be more jolly. So I think um, that's one of the reasons, uh, the main reasons or the main concerns that I have uh, for this virtual setting. And also, again, since um, we are in a medical field and we get to assess them based on their practical skills, so um, this time I cannot um, assess them with real patients because during our return demonstrations or lab prac, they tend to like practice and also assess their family members who are normal. And um, it's really different, yes. Um, it's really I different, but we've, we've been doing it for like a few months now, almost a year or um, we're, we're at the end of the year. So one of the struggles is really how to really um, work with the students, especially in your case and in your um, side in the medical field. Now, aside from that, what are other challenges that um, this, your students face or the teachers face or even the parents face uh, during this um, distance learning, especially in the college education? During virtual classes, although we are just staying at home, we are actually having um, more workload when it comes to the lecture materials as educators because uh, before pre-pandemic we can prepare for our topic for the next day in just like one night or one day since we are going to prepare for handouts only or PowerPoint presentation and that's the standard right but right now during the pandemic so sometimes we uh, give synchronous or live discussions or asynchronous um, classes wherein we get to record uh, lectures and then the 
um, students will just view it anytime they want or within a time uh, period because we uh, we have deadlines also as well like short quizzes for the topic and long quizzes so there are so many things to prepare like links for the um, virtual platforms what else um, you have to encode the quizzes on the platform that we have in school and like before that we get to like uh, just type on the ms word and just print it out and um, make some copies and just hand it out to the students. But right now we have to randomize every questions, eliminate the cheating strategies of the um, students because it's very easy for them to cheat. They, they're just gonna um, add a new tab and then search for the answers for the questions of the quizzes. So, and also you have to make everything interactive to keep them interested during the discussion. So. Uh, right now, all of the teachers, I think everyone can um, relate that you have to also keep up with uh, platforms, electronic devices, and softwares for teaching. So I guess um, that's the majority of my concerns for uh, this pandemic. How about from the students and from the parents? Um, have you encountered some challenges? with the distance learning yes it's much more challenging for the student because we cannot control their internet connection as well and uh, when it was the peak um pandemic season like last year mid-year um actually some of the students lost their family members as well so they get to like um miss some classes and it's very understandable actually so we have to also be forgiving and understanding of their situation, um, their financial um, struggles as well. Some of the students uh, withdraw, withdraw with a program because they don't have uh, financial capabilities to go on, especially they don't have the interest to have online classes because this is a medical course and they're not interested to just do it virtually. So those are um, the problems, but those um, problems are valid. Yes, and we've, we experienced the same thing in the high school, in high school and of course in elementary for some students to feel um, that distance learning is not for them. So for, for now, we are actually um, letting them know that it's okay if you decide to stop, it's okay, you can come back when it's normal. Anyways, the school will always be here, but um, we care more about your, let's say mental health, your, your worries and your anxieties. And of course you are facing, um, most of them are facing a lot more than just completing education. And it would be very unfair for us to like put them in academic pressures, knowing the current situations in life. So yeah, um, we have really um, gone into the world of college education this time. No? And Silverlin, we just like inform the audience and especially you about uh, the Greatness Hub, the channel that we are in. Teaching Out of the Box is only one of the shows that is presented by um, the Greatness Hub. Okay, so the Greatness Hub is IHOP's official transformational online channel. We are having three five shows from Monday to Sunday, and in the Greatness Hub, we cater to all types of audiences, knowing that our shows are different and from val uh, and are different and from varied fields. So, in the Greatness Hub, together, let's discover, develop, and dominate our greatness within. Great people plus great flicks plus great talks equals the Greatness Hub. We have shows from Monday to Sunday, and um. Currently, we are offering. Currently, we are offering um, more um, updates are being um, shown on our page, and we will be launching a website soon on May 15, where you can watch podcasts as well, other than shows, and there will be more exciting things to come. So, we are very much excited and happy to have you um, subscribe and join us here at I Help the Greatness Hub and offer you more and we are hoping that you will enjoy we don't only have shows we also have online courses um upping up our skills on life coaching might might help you so and uh, we are very much um happy to have you here with us we will continue our discussion now with you uh you've already presented the challenges now let us um go on to the positive side of things 
um, knowing that these challenges are here, these challenges we cannot control anymore, what are the things that you did or let's say what are how did you overcome these struggles that you have presented to us a while ago? Mm, I guess I have I as educator it is best that we also update our knowledge. We also have to be um, teachable and also try to learn more and be up to date with the current events and current um, trend when it comes to teaching and learning so um, I get to explore more um, websites and also um, our school actually give us lots of seminar even before the pandemic we had seminars about e-learning so this platform virtual platform for um, teaching and learning is not actually alien to us um, it is quite familiar, but it's still challenging. However, it is very vulnerable because of the continuing education programs that we have um, or is provided for us. Especially we are teaching adult learners. So as much as possible, we have to give interactive um, materials and update ourselves. We are actually um, moving towards paperless education. Um, even before the pandemic. So um, some of our quizzes, exams are given online. However, now um, we have adapted a, an official platform that our school actually um, got for us before we started this uh, virtual classes um, to also cater to the students who are interested in um, this program, which is virtual classrooms already. That's nice. Even if no one prepared us for the pandemic, at least in your university, you were able to prepare in advance to like slowly move into the distance learning or in the online platform of learning. And that's one of the positive things I think that the pandemic has brought us, that we were able to push ourselves to really go online already or to go virtual, to explore um, the, the advantages of online learning. Knowing that in this distance learning, teachers are not the only ones who are facilitating the learning of our students, right? Um, th there are key persons at home that are helping our students uh, continue uh, learning, doing learning even at home. So what are, if you can give tips to parents um, who are having like college students doing distance learning or online learning at home, especially now that um, they spend not most of their time, you had all of their time at home doing the learning. So what are your tips to those parents? Uh, my humble tips for those parents are um, just to keep a peaceful and stress-free environment for their children because, again, I am teaching in the university already and they are adult learners or most of them are adolescents already. So I would like to just remind them that um, to just keep their uh, the child's mental health in check okay? um, because I believe that the students or a person's interest or concentration is rooted from their um, personal problems in the family and conflicts as well. So try to always be a source of strength and comfort to your children. Um, I encountered some instances wherein we are doing our return demos or live lab practical exam wherein the student is like crying because uh, um, she cannot get the patient because um, she wanted um, her patient to be her sibling, but then her sibling and her mother are arguing, arguing outside and it, it's her time. We are giving them, for example, three to five minutes. And then there's um, a list of students who will enter the link. And so we cannot control that, but as much as possible, always have like a stress-free environment for the child because right now um, they are stuck at home. Unlike before, they can go somewhere or to school to like distress from their personal problems at home but now they are stuck uh, with the stress of school and also the stress of family problems so always try to keep your um, child in um, on check and also uh, I want them to also not pacify the mistakes of their children since they are already adults actually pre-pandemic 
some um, parents actually go to the office and complain with this and that and even if there are valid proofs that their child is cheating because we actually have like video cameras if we suspect someone is doing something questionable so i just want them to let their child own to their mistakes and accept the consequences okay and i think that's all just check your child's overall well-being since they are already adults and it's our duty to educate them when it comes to iq but it's your job uh, when it comes to their eq yes our uh, senior high department we are doing whatever way we can to prepare the student not just academically but also emotionally when they go to college we always tell them our students that when you go to college your professors will not like follow after you like we do here in the basic education because in the basic education i can really say that the students are really pampered we really follow up we really do make calls and we really make sure that they're doing this task and so on but we know in college it's more on the academic side already of things and it's a major or an important role that parents play in their students or in their child's education really starts at home so that when they go to school or when they uh, do the online classes they are very much focused on the task at hand so this is a reassurance that we in the basic education department we are doing our best to like prepare the students to be to become better learners adult learners when they go to college so um you mentioning us the struggle the the challenges and the struggles and how you overcame them and the tips that you have for parents um what did you discover in yourself silverlin in being a teacher both in pre-pandemic and post and during the pandemic okay so um i discovered that as a teacher or educator um we can easily get respect uh, from the students if they would uh, feel that they are respected first because again they are already adult learners in the college settings so you always have to be open-minded and accept their um was that uh, reasonings and welcome their ideas during discussions because even if we are already professors or educators we, we are not always right and our profession especially in the medical field is ever evolving so uh, there are constant updates on the most effective or evidence-based assessments treatments for the patients so always be uh, teachable again and open-minded so that's what i've learned as well I've developed as an individual and what I've learned to um, what grasp as an educator. I've also realized that since they are already um, adult learners, I expect a lot from my students. So I don't tolerate any tardiness or like missed um, deadlines or cheating in any form. I'm actually one of the um, teachers or educators who give good grades but if i catch you doing something um unethical then um sorry but i have to give you the um, consequences so that's it because i think uh, more than more than the academics it's more on teaching them how to be like ethical students and like the standards we, we cannot um lower our standards because of course it is life that you are dealing with when or like the students will be dealing with when they go out of the university right and um in the years that you have been as that you have been a teacher silver lane what can you consider as your educational innovation mm, in the years that i have been a teacher i have considered um the outcome-based program that we have already and also the flipped classroom setting because majority of our discussions again is um, through assessments and exercises of patients and clients so um, we actually let the student illustrate the exercises and assessment and along the way we give um, feedbacks formative or along the um, semester and summative after the module is done or the course is done so that is what we um, inculcate to our latest batches and what else we tend to always be updated with electro electronic platforms as well and programs um keep up with the modern age even if um, i don't consider myself as well as the old age but um just to keep up because the younger generations are really updated okay um they are more knowledgeable than us even when it comes to um using 
social networking and um, electronic devices. What else? Um, some of the innovations that we have as well is uh, giving strict protocols when it comes to like case conferences that they have to give like evidence-based assessment, outcome measures, innovations, and treatment to the patient because some of the treatments and assessments are already like from 19, 19 forgotten, so it's not <laughs> acceptable anymore or applicable to our population nowadays. And um, to always keep classes interactive as well, give games and cases, case conferences, and etc. Yeah, that's one thing I miss about being like a science teacher, you being in the medical field. I was your physics teacher before. Now I'm solely focusing on math. And that's one thing I miss about the, the science field, about being always updated. You cannot um, like be the same teacher that you are in the previous year. Although I still apply that in my math that every year I try to like change my strategies or the ways that I do things but in science you can you can never go away with the updates or the um the, the most recent way of doing things and knowing that you are preparing the these students um for the future they should be prepared not to like to like adapt to changes and I am so happy Silverlin seeing you like seeing you grow into becoming a, a an educator you have redesigned the learning experiences for your students because um you have experienced pre-pandemic and now in the pandemic times a lot of things has changed and it's nice to know that in the previous episodes that i had the primary is like preparing the students to become high school students and then the high school the high school teachers are pre preparing the students to become ready for college education so it's a series and we all have to take part and do our roles in producing um good citizens of of our society so um silverlin if you were to just redesign the learning experience for your students where is uh physical therapy education leading into Okay, so um, right now, the interns actually have their tele-rehab program. It, it is like a um, sub-category uh, of the telemedicine. So the interns are given the chance to push the tele-rehab program, which is actually very um, common in um, the, um, the first world countries like America, UK, uh, Singapore. So they get to meet and assess and give intervention to patients virtually already. Although we don't have like a specific platform for that yet, because again, we uh, were um, prematurely <laughs> um, put in this situation because of the pandemic. Okay, so I think that will be the change for the next semester, if ever, hopefully not, the pandemic will extend. So the only way for the students or uh, third year students who are um, what transitioning towards become interns is that they will have an experience with the patient, but virtually. So they have to um, design assessments and exercises or interventions that is applicable um, at home with a patient. Okay, or um, aside from dumbbells, they can use like water bottles for their weights and etc. So their innovate innovative brains will actually be um, developed. So to give the interventions that is equal in a clinical setting to the patient's home. Exciting. That's very exciting. If only we could like. Um, stabilize the situation now if things will become normal there are still things in the pan pandemic period that we could bring into it. um as a last question silverlin what is your advice to other educators handling college students my major advice is that again always be teachable okay even if we are already in this field for years and years we are we have still yet so many um learnings to um to absorb not only from our colleagues but also from our students because they are already in a, the advanced stage they can actually grasp more information and perform even better than you and that's the goal right as an educator that you can see your students um, succeed and even become better than you in the real life or real world 
So again, be teachable, be open-minded, and be very understanding in guiding them to become um, professional someday and apply the theories that you have given them in the classroom setting to the real world. Thank you very much, Silverlin, for gracing us this evening. And we are so happy that um, the college education is still going or pushing through with quality, giving quality education to the students amidst um, the struggles and the challenges we face in the pandemic. And personally, I am so happy to see you um, become a very good teacher. Like, I am also just paying it forward why I became a teacher, I'm also just paying it forward because I had good teachers before. And it's nice to see that you as my student now is also like inspiring and motivating other students to become um, better in the profession or in the chosen field that they will um, be getting into. And knowing you, you will still achieve more and you will store greater heights. And I hope whatever uh, dreams and wishes you have for your profession, I hope you get to practice your um, license soon we are if you have comments and questions you can like type them down in the comments um, comment box below and silverlin and i will try to answer those questions that you have um, by the way silverlin if they have questions and concerns to you where can they reach you uh, you can email me at silverlin marie just my full name at gmail.com um in lower cases and also you can search me on facebook silverlin marie sabandal so just say hi and where did you like meet me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, once again, everyone, thank you for watching Teaching Out of the Box for inspirational conversations and educational innovations and redesign learning experiences. We have once again made a breakthrough in education that will reshape the way we view teaching and learning. Join me again next week, Tuesday from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. only on the Greatness Hub online channel at the Greatness Hub. Together, we discover, we develop, and we dominate our greatness. See ya! See ya! Thank you! In life, there's greatness inside of you. Let's do greatness with love. Unleash it in the greatness of the greatness of His love Transformation that you can have Coming from God above Welcome to the greatness of Welcome to the greatness of Hub. Together we discover, we develop, and we dominate our greatness. See ya!